Um, hey, let's pray real quick. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this morning. Lord, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, open our ears to hear what it is that you want to say. God, not what's coming out of my mouth. What does the Holy Spirit want to say to us? Father, open our eyes to see what we need to see. And Father, I pray, God, specifically this morning for every uh, circumstance, situation, issue that ended up in that box last week. These are, this is a list. This is a bunch of things that us as a community, we know that we need to change. They're not New Year's resolutions. It's not what we want to change. These are things you spoke to us and you said we need to change. So Father, I pray for each person represented, each issue, that Lord, you would connect dots today with, with that particular thing. And Father, continue to take us on a journey towards freedom and deliverance and wholeness in that area of our life. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Hey, it was, um, it was Isaac Newton. Uh, any, any physicists, uh, them types of people here? No? <laughs> Another am I, I just know the quote. It was Isaac Newton, in his first law of motion, goes this way. It says, Everything continues in a state of rest unless it is compelled to change by forces impressed upon it. Everything continues in a state of rest unless it is compelled to change by forces that are impressed upon us. We, we, if you weren't here last week, can I encourage you to do this? And, and I want you to do this, and we don't... I don't care whether you don't go back and you missed last week's message most weeks, but I do this week. Uh, go on YouTube, go to Arise thing, and if you weren't here last week, can you please listen to what we talked about last week? Because we're spending four weeks kind of building on this issue of, um, you know, so, so many people when it comes to New Year's, we get a list of things we call resolutions. And New Year's resolutions are things that you want to change. And statistically, 91% of those will not happen. 91% of New Year's resolutions will be dead. Uh, 23% are gone within the first week. Another 34%, I think it is, are gone within the first month. And by 3.2 months, 91% of them are dead and buried. Uh, but you don't let go of them because you bring them up next year, don't you? And the year after and the year after. And we keep going back to these things. So New Year's resolutions are basically a list of things I want to change. And what we talked about last week was what if we spent 2024 going, oh, I'm not going to uh, uh, focus on what I want to change. What if, what if I focused on what I need to change? What if I focused on that area that I need to change in? What's that area of my life that if I don't get a grip on it and change in it now, I will eventually be forced to change because of the consequences of where that thing is going to take me in life? What direction is that taking me in life? What cost will I eventually pay that will force me to change? In other words, we're going to change before we have to or we're going to change because we have to. What's that area in your life? So I don't want to go over the whole thing, but go back and I want you to listen to last week's message because the next three weeks, we're going to continue to build on that thought. And we're going to talk about some simple things that are going to give us the best chance, I think, to actually follow through and know that what's in that box there, those things that you wrote and put in that box, we are going to wrestle them things to the ground, not in our own willpower. We're going to do it by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, but we are going to play our part. We're going to do our bit and we're going to wrestle that stuff to the ground so that come 2024 we get to the end of 2024 instead of being part of the 91 percent of human beings who will go geez a new year what are my resolutions oh no i didn't do them all last year instead of looking back and going nothing changed back there 91 percent of things didn't change we're going to look back and go regardless of what i wanted to change the one area that i needed to change by the grace of god and power of the holy spirit we wrestled that thing to the ground and it's going to be a great year if we can do that amen if we can deal with that thing that we know, if I don't change now, consequence is going to hit me up the side of the head and I'm going to be forced to change. And once I'm forced to change, here's the reality, there's no guarantee that whatever the price is I pay before I change, there's no guarantee that you're going to get a second chance at that. And last week I talked about a few examples and friends I know. Some who didn't change before they had to, changed because they had to. But thankfully they got a second chance. But I've also got friends who didn't change before they had to. They changed because they had to, and it cost them a lot in life. And some of those people never got second chances. They didn't get a chance to go back. God is a God of second chances, amen? Third, fourth, and fifth. But your boss probably isn't. Maybe your spouse isn't. Maybe your kids aren't. Maybe your body isn't. There's so many areas of life where we get the opportunity to change before we have to. Most people wait and change because they have to. And in a lot of cases, it's too late. So why don't we be people that change before we have to in those areas where we know God has spoken to us? And last week, I kept saying to you, all through the service, what is the Holy Spirit saying? So what's in that box is not what you want to change. What's in that box is what you last week felt the Holy Spirit spoke to you and said, no, you need to change. You need to change. So hang on to that. 
Newton's first law of motion. Everything continues in a state of rest until it's compelled to change by forces impressed upon it. But what if something has changed before that? And that's what we're talking about. There's another old proverb, and it goes this way. It says, some people will change when they see the light. Others change only when they feel the heat. Some people change when they see the light. Others only change when they feel the heat. Well, again, what we're looking at in that box, that was you seeing the light. I want you to remember that. Because I know what it's like seven days on from hearing something like that and going through that. I know, I, I know that the, the, kind of the intensity can dim and the need dims and the expectation dims and everything kind of drops. But hey, you rode in there, people. You came forward. No one forced you. No one put a gun to your head. You came forward because you felt the Holy Spirit speak to you and say, this is an area I need to change in. So I want you to carry that through. I want you to think about that. We're talking about changing because we've seen the light. We're talking about the change we need to make, not just the change we want to make. And we're talking about changing before we have to, not because we have to. And by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, I believe that we can change in those areas. Remember uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says this, it says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. Who's throwing everything off? We are. Who's running with perseverance? We are. We participate with God. I love what Kate shared this morning. Sometimes we go, okay, God, you spoke this. I'm going to put it in the box. And everyone else, I hope you're praying for me. And everyone else, I hope you're believing for me. And everyone else, I hope you're doing whatever you need to do to help me get through. But what are we doing? What are we doing? Just because I give my life to Jesus. When I come to faith, my spirit is transformed and renewed. My heart, right? The Bible talks about that. It says, I'll take out your dead spirit. In Ezekiel 36, I'll give you a new spirit. I'll take out your heart of stone. I'll give you a heart of flesh. And then I'll place my spirit in your spirit and I'll cause you to walk in my ways. I'm transformed there. But it also says, I've got to renew my own mind, doesn't it? Romans talks about renew your mind. Renew your mind. It also talks about uh, uh, my body, lay my body down as a living sacrifice. Just because I came to Jesus doesn't mean every single area of my life changed. I came to faith. I was in YWAM living on $14 a week. And the day after, sorry, I came to faith before I went to YWAM. But I, was, I, I came to faith and then I went and joined YWAM. And I was living on nothing before I came to faith. I joined YWAM. I was still living on nothing. God didn't give me a billion dollars. I wish he did. But he didn't transform my bank account when I came to faith. He says to me, hey, I've given you this little thing called wisdom. Be smart. I've given you a body. Work hard. Do what you can do. Cooperate with me. Do the basics. Do some stuff right. He gave me a body. He says, look after your body. He gave me a brain. He says, stimulate your mind. Learn. So just because I came to faith doesn't mean that every area of my life is just going to be tackled. And just because I wrote something in a box last week and people are praying doesn't mean it's all going to transform and change if I don't commit to doing the work I've got to do, which is the stuff that God's speaking to me about. Amen. There's only one thing in the world. People talk about authority. We want authority over this. You know, there's only one realm of life where you have 100% authority. It's over yourself. That's it. You only ever truly have 100% authority over yourself. You can feel like you do at work and you can tell that person to do that and they can turn around to you and go, Pfft. they won't have a job, but they can do that because you don't have as much authority as you think. At the end of the day, the only realm of life we have 100% authority in is in our own world. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And some of the stuff in that box, some of it is sin. Some of it is stuff that we know, habits and things that we know go against the way God wants us to live. Some of them are just stuff that's entangling, holding us back and slowing us down. Not necessarily sin, but we know it's not good for us. We know it's not helping us get to the place God wants us to go to. We know it's not helping us be the people that God wants us to. And the writer of Hebrews says, well, you've got to throw some of that stuff off. And you've got to run with perseverance the race that's marked out for you. The things in that box, they, 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 they're God things. They're God ideas. They're not just good ideas. I want you to remember that as we go through these next few weeks. So what I want to talk about this week is I want to talk about motivation. A little bit about motivation. Now, don't think I'm going to be Anthony Robbins. I'm not talking about Anthony Robbins and that kind of motivation. But what I want to talk about is our motivation for change. Why? Why should you do the work required? Why should you continue to believe? Why should you continue to wrestle this thing? Why should you go after that thing in your life? Why? What are the reasons why it's really, really important that you don't just write that down and then we just move on to another sermon and another sermon and another sermon and by February this year, you've forgotten about that. You haven't changed. You're exactly the same. We're all the same. Why can't you let that happen? Well, today I want to talk about a couple of areas of motivation, some things that will help us 
to see this process through in our life. Uh, if you've got a Bible there, go to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter, I think we've got the thing up there. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. There was a guy by the name of Abram, and God came to Abram and said, Abram, there are some things in your world that I'm going to change. There are some things in your world that I'm going to change. And what he does is God is smart. God knows that, that just saying, you've, when, when God says things like fear not, right? one of the most broadly mentioned commands in the Bible, when God says fear not, you know he doesn't just go fear not and then walks away and then you've just got to just fear not. No, he gives you reasons for things, doesn't he? God gives us reasons. He says fear not. Why can you fear not? I'm with you. I'm with you. So, so fear, you have to fear in life. Yeah, you're going to have hard times, you're going to have difficult circumstances, but God's there going, I'm telling you not to fear, but, but the way that you know not to fear, the way that I empower you and motivate you to not fear is I let you know, hey, I'm with you. And if God be for you, then who can be against you in this life? People can do damage to the body, but they can't damage the spirit and the soul. You could do what you want to me. One day I'm going to die and I'm going to go to a better place and I'm going to be with, with Jesus. That's what I believe. And so God comes to Abram and says, I've got these big changes about to happen in your life. Now, whatever you wrote in that box, I'm going to dare say some of that stuff there probably doesn't compare to the magnitude of the change that God came to Abram and said, hey, here's what I want you to change. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country. Get up and go from your country. Leave your country. This, I need you to change countries, Abram. Change your people. I need you to go to another people. And I need you to leave your father's household. And I need you to go to a land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. And I'll bless you. I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. Abram, you're going to leave your country. I want you to change your people you're hanging with. I want you to get away from your father's household. And you're going to a land that I haven't even told you where you're going yet. And by the way, Abram, you got a wife. You're going to go home and tell her we're packing everybody up and we're moving. And she's going to say where? And you're going to look her in the eye and go, I don't know. Deal with that one. How would that go down for most men in this place? At least we want to know where we're going. But you don't even tell him. So there's some massive changes that God is calling Abram to make. But I love that God doesn't just say, here's the change you've got to make, and then God walks away and goes, you deal with it. Now, God gives Abram three little motivations. I'm going to give you some reasons, Abram, why it's worth making this change. I'm going to give you some reasons that when it gets tough and when it gets hard, when you want to go back to what's familiar and so on, I'm going to give you some reasons that hopefully will keep you on the path and keep you going forward. None of these reasons are going to blow your mind. You know them. But I want you to connect them today with what's in that box. And if you don't have something in that box yet, it's not too late. You might think of something today. We'll give you a pen and paper, write it down, an envelope. You put it in. It's all confidential. Nobody's going to see anything in that box. You're going to get it back in three weeks' time. And you can look at it and you can sit with God and so on. Nobody's reading it out. Nobody's looking at it. It's you and God. But what we are doing is every day people are praying over that box. This week we had some people contact me. Can I come on in? Open the door. They come in and they're praying over the box. We're praying. That's what we can do for one another. But we've still got to stay the course ourselves. We've still got to do what's required of us. Lord God said to Abram, go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land I'll show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you and I'll make your name great. Abram was being called to make some massive changes in his life. Three motivations, three reasons that, Abram, that God gave to Abram to help him make the changes that he knew that he needed to make. The first one, which is the most popular reason for change in most situations of life, it's the benefit to self. The benefit to self. This is perhaps the primary motivation for most New Year's resolutions. We sit back and we go, what's in this for me? Okay, if I make this change, how does this change make my personal life better than it is right now? And the truth is that there's definitely something in it for you when God calls you to change. Amen? Who believes that? There's, there's something in us every time we take a step of obedience in the direction that God calls us to take it. There's always going to be something in it for us because obedience always precedes blessing. And by blessing, I'm not saying that, you know, when we hear that word blessing, it's like Kate was saying with prosperity, a million dollars and cars and so on. I don't need all that stuff. There's way more prosperous and blessed things in life than money and toys things that moth and rust are going to destroy. I'm thinking bigger than that. I'm thinking bigger than that. I'm not saying God doesn't want to bless us materially. I'm sure he does. has no problem doing it. And I think that, that, that it's a great thing. And Lord, I would much rather have more money than less money. You hear me here publicly. 
The blessing is way beyond that. And there's definitely a blessing in this for us if we will see our way through to the end of this change. God said to Abram, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. Very, very clearly. God is a good, good father. He is a good God. And God wants to bless us. God is not... Some people have an image of God like that child with the anthill. You know, the bull ants. Maybe it was only me that did this, but I reckon a lot of other boys did too. When I was lived out west as a kid, there were these big bull ants and they would run around the ants' nest. And we get a magnifying glass. Anyone ever get that? And you would like, put the magnifying glass, burn them suckers on the anthill. Anyone ever do that? No, you're all redeemed. We don't do that. I used to do it, all right? And burn, you know, and sometimes we have an image of God, our Heavenly Father like that. He's just waiting to trap us in something bad. He's waiting to punish us for something. We can do 99 good things, but God is just overly focused on the one thing that you're not nailing. Sometimes we have this image of God, and it creates this Christianity that's really about, it's performance-based, and Christianity becomes nothing more than trying to adjust our behaviours and make ourselves better people and nothing to do with intimacy with a God that actually loves us and wants to know us and wants us to know him. There's definitely a blessing in it. God made it very clear. He said, I'll bless you. So whatever that area is that you need to change in, the truth is that it needs to be removed because it's probably stopping something good from flowing into your life. If you can wrestle this thing to the ground and deal with this, I'll guarantee you that there's something good because God pointed this out to you. It's a God idea, not a good idea. There's something good that God wants to bring into your world and maybe that area is holding it back. Maybe that area is, is slowing it down. Maybe that area is blocking whatever that good thing is that God has for you that God wants to pour into your life. You know, I like to stay fit. Uh, uh, but, but I'm mostly motivated when I've got a, a sports tournament coming up. I'm super fit during summer because that's when all the touch tournaments are on and stuff around the place. Winter? Eh. Why? Well, there's really nothing in it for me, is there? You know, There's nothing in it running around in circles, sweating myself, going, why am I doing this for? Nothing, just for your own personal health. Eh. It's just not enough to just do it for that. But when I have, have something in it for me, I get to run out there and be the best touch player on the field and I get the, you know, the, the accolades and you score tries and I'm going to... But then when that's not happening, dude, I'd sit on the lounge and watch the cricket. Anything but that. As counterintuitive as this may sound, I believe that this reason alone, if this is the only reason why you're going to go after that, I reckon this is part of the reason why most resolutions fail. Because at the end of the day, what's in it for me, it's not enough when the going gets tough. When it gets really hard and tough, what's in it for me is just not a powerful enough motivation for change. We know that 91% of people made these resolutions because of what's in it for them uh, and then they didn't follow it through. It's not a good enough motivation for people, what's in it for me. One of the reasons we easily give up on change is because we become comfortable with the impact of our dysfunction. We become comfortable with that area in our life. We can become very relaxed about it. We can become very relaxed about it, even though we need to change. And hopefully because of that, we now want this change. The truth is, if the pain of changing becomes too great, there are some perceived benefits if we just simply don't change, if we just roll over and keep living this way. Number one, it's familiar. It's been a part of our normal for a very long time, hasn't it? Whatever's in that box, it's probably normal to you. You've probably been doing it or thinking it or acting it or living it or so on for such a long time that it's actually familiar to you. You know that space. You know what it feels like. It's familiar. It's normal. That's normal. What you're entering into is something that's abnormal to you right now because you don't know what it's like to be free of that. You don't know what it's like to not have that habit. You don't know what it's like to not think like that. You don't know what it's like to treat your husband or your wife differently. You don't know what it's like to treat your kids differently. You don't know what it's like to actually pull your bootstraps up at work, not whinge and complain about everything I actually do. You don't know all these areas, whatever's in that box, the change that comes about, it's unfamiliar. But if you stay the same, it's kind of familiar. So if it gets really hard during the change process, it's not too... It, it, you, you, there's an easy temptation to go, well, that's just too hard. I'll just go back to this because at least I know I can live in that. So I've been doing it for a while. Mightn't like it. But it's easy. It's familiar. Secondly, it's comfortable. Some of this stuff becomes really, really comfortable. I think Jackie shared last week, I had a, a, a stomach problem. Many, many, many years ago, I used to get this deep burning in my stomach for years and years and years as a kid and into our marriage and so on, just such a deep burning. And one day I'm sitting in a church service in Bundaberg and this guy gets up and goes, look, I just really feel like I want to pray for people for healing. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, Lord, you know, anyone that's sick, God, would you, you know, move and so and then Jackie nudges me as wives do and goes, what about the pain in your stomach? And I was like, 
Oh, yeah. I got so used to it because I just live with it 24-7, I didn't even think of it. Where even when a guy stands up there and goes, we want to pray, I'm thinking, that's just normal. Anyway, I got up, got prayed for, nothing happened. I didn't fall over, didn't shake, rattle and roll, nothing like that. Didn't feel a goosebump, hair didn't stand up. But he's prayed this simple little prayer over I was sat back down, still felt the same way. Went to bed the next, that night, woke up the next day, halfway through the day, I suddenly stopped and went, I haven't had that pain. And I haven't had that pain again a day since that in my early 20s. Just like that. But I got so comfortable with it, I could have just stayed in that chair. Had Jackie not nudged me, I'd, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Praise God for a wife's elbow. <laughs> and it's probably easy because it's become a default for us. In other words, without conscious effort to resist it, we effortless, effortlessly fall back into it, don't we? Because it's familiar, it's normal, and it's comfortable. So if we don't follow through with the work that's needed to change, we know exactly what we're going back to, which is why God gave Abraham some extra points of motivation. The next point of motivation is obedience to the word of God. Now, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're somebody that has, has, has made the decision that the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, it really happened, and it has real implications for your life, and that Jesus did for you that which you couldn't do for yourself, and if you really believe some of the, these ancient writers wrote things such as, you are not your own, you bought with a price. If we really believe that sort of stuff, then surely within us there's a desire to go, okay, if, in Luke chapter 6, Jesus made this statement when he talked about the wise and foolish builder. He said, he started by saying, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but not do the things I say? Why, why do you call me Lord? Why, why are you saying that I've got that place in your life, but, but you don't do anything that I tell you to do? In other words, what he's saying is... You, you actually can't because if, cause th that word Lord means something. You know? That Lord means... So if we're Christians, surely there's a desire inside of us to go at a very base level, okay, I'm going to start not just hearing teachings about Jesus, but I want to go to that point of obeying. I want to start doing the things that God's speaking to me about and the things that God is saying. We're not our own. We've been bought with a price. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 6. I love this story. Uh, it says, one day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. So he's teaching. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. So there's two guys there. They're, 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 they're out of the, of the water. Not only have they pulled the boat up, they've got the nets out of the boat and they're cleaning them. That's, that, that, that's them saying we're done. There's nothing out there to catch. It's over. So we're hanging up our boots for the day. We, uh, for the night, we've done our job. And so not only did they pull the boat up and left the nets there thinking, well, maybe we might go back out. They've gone, no, this is it. Nets are out. We're mending and cleaning and some. We've had it. And so Jesus comes along and, and, and Jesus says to them, you know, push your boat out. Uh, push your boat out there. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon. He said, put it out a little from shore. He sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And it keeps going on from there. He said, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out in the deep water, let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. And some of you have worked hard and long at whatever that thing is in the box. You've prayed and you feel like you've done and you feel like you've tried to, to do whatever it is that you can. And some of you are just like these guys. You've pulled the boat into the shore, you've pulled the nets out and you've just given up. That's it. But I love what Peter says. He says, we worked hard all night and we've caught nothing. Nothing has changed and we've worked really hard, but because you say so. Because you say so. I'll go and we'll, we'll let the nets down again. And, and, and some of this stuff in here, you've worked hard and you've done what you can with that area of your life and you're just like these guys, you've given up. But what I want to say to you is last week, because he said so. Because he said so. Remember, I didn't tell you this. I didn't hype you up. I didn't make you come up with something. I didn't. You were there and I kept saying to you, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Don't get up. Don't write it down. Don't put it in there if there's nothing. And about 75, 80% of people got up and sat down and wrote and put in there. So I can only assume that the Holy Spirit was speaking to you because he said so. So don't give up. Don't give up. If nothing else, you need to do the work. Why? Because your heavenly father asked you to. Your heavenly father said so. 
And if there's no other motivation you can find, if motivation for self is not enough, and I get it, because I'm not really motivated just for me, I've got to have other motivations too, then the next thing that he gives to Abraham is, he actually says, it says, the Lord said to Abram, God spoke to him. Abram didn't go, you know what, what, what area could I change? I'd really love to change my household and I'd love to change my country and I'd love to go to another people. I'd love to get out of dad's, you know, nest and geez, I'd love to, and also I'd love to tell my wife at the end of this, we don't even know where we're going. No, he didn't. He did it. Why? Because the Lord said. Because God said. And God's speaking to you about this area of change. So in obedience, we want to follow through with this and we want to do the work that we know that we need to do. Because you say so, Peter said. And this time, they actually caught fish. There's something about God's timing in life. There's something about God's timing. You know, I've known that there's something wrong with me for 51 years of my life. Might come as a shock to some of you. I've known, except for my wife, I've known that there are some things wrong with me. I've known that there's <coughs> stuff that, that has impacted the way that I have been a husband to my wife and the way I've been a father to my kids. <coughs> years and years. And I spent years and years praying, saying, God, that thing, I know, I know because of my background and some of my responses, I know, God, that there's stuff in here that hasn't been dealt with. Just because I became a Christian, there's still a place of unpacking <coughs> some of this stuff in my life. And I've known that there was something there. You know, <coughs> I was driving my car recently, about a year ago. And as I'm driving the car, I just had a picture <coughs> of, a moment, <coughs> of a moment that happened to me when I was a child. I pulled over the car straight away. And I knew that that was God saying to me, this is a Kairos moment for you. This is a divine moment. I'm showing you something. Now, what are you going to do? Well, I've got some friends of mine who are, 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 are counsellors, and so I rang them up, said, hey, can I come and meet with you ASAP? This could be three seconds long, five minutes long. I've got no idea. All I know is I just had a memory come back that I just feel like God gave it to me, and I've got to unpack it because this is my time right now. I'm not going to wait six months, 12 months. This is my time. And they were great. They said, yep. I went and sat in their office and I said to them, right, here's the deal. I'm just going to tell you this one thing and that's it. And if I'm out of here in five minutes, so be it. But I just believe God wants me to do this. One and a half hours later with a pile of tissues that high next to me. I didn't realise so much mucus could come out of one body. <laughs> Hour and a half. Led to another session, another session. Had about four or five sessions with It was a Kairos time. It was a moment where God said, for years and years I've been praying and trying and wanting and willpowering and so on and nothing changed. But this was a God moment for me. And because God said, this is your time, I stepped into it and I did what I had to do. And what's in that box right now is God saying to you, it's your time. It's your time. So believe that. Believe that. If motivation for, if you look at the benefits for yourself and you go, well, that's not enough, well, then tack this one on there too. Your Heavenly Father asked you to do something. God's speaking to you about something. He's giving you a divine moment and a divine time. See, the change I want to make is a good idea, but the change I need to make, that's a God idea in that box. Now we're moving out of that realm of just simply self-help. It's not about self-help. We, we, we talked last week, we're doing this by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God. It's not our own strength. If you could change this area of your life in your own willpower, you would have done it by now, amen? You wouldn't be that kind of husband if you knew you could do it in your own strength. You wouldn't be that kind of wife if you knew you could do it in your own strength. You wouldn't be that kind of, of, of father or parent or mother. You wouldn't be that kind of employer. You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't have that habit. You wouldn't think that way. If you could change this in your own willpower, you would have done it by now because you're good people. You love, you love the people around you. You know it impacts them. You would have changed it by now, but you can't. This is why I really believe that the Holy Spirit's saying to us, 2024 is going to be a good year. We're going to wrestle this thing to the ground. But God's going to take us on a journey. He's not going to do all the hard work, but it's his season. It's almost like when God speaks, you, you, it's almost like you jump into a slipstream. And God's, there's this momentum and God's pushing us in that direction. And that's where we're at at the moment. Thirdly, the third benefit that God gave to Abram is the benefit to those around you. What's the benefit to those around you when you wrestle this thing to the ground? What's going to be the benefit to the people around you when you make the change? What's going to be the benefit to your family when that, when that thing no longer holds you back or controls you? What's going to be the benefit to your marriage when that thing no longer dominates What's going to be the benefit to your, you mentally? What's going to be the benefit to, to, to your workplace? What's going to be the benefit to the kingdom of God, to the church? What's going to be the benefit to the people that you play sport with? What's going to be the benefit to your neighbours? What's going to be the benefit to other people if you wrestle this thing to the ground and you follow it through? 
We've got, the, we've got the motivation of the benefit for self. We've got the motivation of obedience to the word of God. Now what's the benefit to those around you if you're listening? He says, I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Here's the thing. Most of the time we interpret that this way. I'll make your name great and what you do will be a blessing to others. He didn't say what you do will be a blessing. He said you will be. You the person. You as a, you as a human being. You as a, an image bearer of God. You will be the blessing. Now, of course, if you're a blessing, you'll do things that bless people. But sometimes we just look around and go, because somebody does stuff that blesses, oh, that's, no, that's not, God was not talking about just, I'm going to get you to just do good things for me that make other people feel good or bless other people. So I'm going to turn you into the blessing. You're the person. You're the person. See, a lot of you are, a lot of you are already blessings to other people because you do things. And, and, and somehow this stuff gets masked or covered over or in some cases kept hidden. And we can still do all that stuff. But God goes beyond just, um, when I say you're going to be a blessing, I'm not just saying that you'll, you'll, you'll do that, but you're still hiding all this side of your life. He said, no, no, I want to connect this side of your world with everything that's going on out there. I want to connect it together so there's no masks, there's no shame, there's no guilt, there's no double-sided to the, it's just, this is just who I am, and I'm doing who I am. That peace that we find when we know we're not being fake. God calls Abram to a lot of change. But he tells him that at the end of the story, if you will tough this out, he says, you're actually going to be a blessing. You're going to be a blessing. See, the change God wants me to make is never only about me. It always includes others. It's always going to bless other people. You look at the life of Moses. I love the story of Moses. Acts chapter 7, verse 23 to 25. Stephen, uh, just before he's martyred, remember he gives the religious leaders this great big story of the history of the Jews and they're all around him. I'm smug going, yes, that's true. We're this and we're that. And then he takes a sharp left turn right at the end and goes, you always killed the prophets and anyone that tried to speak to you about God. And they pick up their stones and kill him. But in that discourse, he says this, when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Now watch this. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they didn't. Go back and read that story now in Exodus of when Moses kills the Egyptian and don't look at it as a blitz on the radar. Don't look at it as Moses just killed this guy. No, no, Moses knew exactly what was going on. He knew way back then, God's called me. I'm going to be the great deliverer of my people. <laughs> very self-assured, very self-confident. Goes in there and bops this Egyptian and kills him. And of course, we all know the story. The next day, he goes and sees two Jews fight and he tries to break them up. And one turns and goes, you're going to kill me like you did the Egyptian? And he realizes, oh my goodness. I, 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 think, I think I know what I'm called to do, but these guys don't see that. And he takes off. Because he knows he's in a world of trouble. He knew he was called to deliver Israel, but he needed to change. He needed to change. He wasn't ready. God, God can call you for something. God can call you to do something. God can show you this is the blessing you're going to be to the world around you, but it's still you. God needs to change us. He wants to work on us. He wants us to come in alignment with how he sees us and who we're created to be. The next time God comes to him, he's herding sheep. He's herding sheep. He's not so self-assured. All of a sudden, he's not so self-confident. He's a different person, isn't he? He's a different person. He's changed. The Lord said, in Exodus 3, 7, He said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I'm concerned about their suffering. You see, Moses was already blessed. He should have been killed with all the other babies when he was born, but he was saved. He ended up being nursed by his own mother and then raised in the household of Pharaoh. So by all accounts... Moses had a pretty good life. Moses had a pretty good life. He was definitely blessed, but it wasn't enough. He was born to be a blessing to others. But he had to change. He had to change. God had to bring about change in his life so that he could be that blessing that he was created to be. And when you think about what's in that box, when you wrestle that thing to the ground, when you deal with that, guess what? There's a blessing to the people around you. And if, if, if the benefits to yourself is not enough of a motivation, I get it. Then think about obedience to God. I hope that's enough of a motivation. And if it's not, then add to that the benefits to those around you when you defeat this thing. By the power of God and grace of God, power of the Holy Spirit, you wrestle that thing to the ground, the benefits to your family, your friends, your neighbours, your community, your church. 
See, we cannot escape the design of God. We're blessed to be a blessing. We're called to be the answers to someone else's prayers and problems. God didn't come to Moses and go, well, I've seen your great gifts and your great talent. And he said, you know what? I've heard the cries of these people over here. These guys are suffering. These guys are hurting. These guys need help and I'm going to choose you. And God wants to change me to the point where I become the answer to somebody else's prayer. Where I can become the answer to somebody else's problem. I can become a part of the solution for other people and what they're going through in life as well. I'm blessed, but I'm blessed to be a blessing. And we cannot escape the reality that that's how God designed us. So this is why self-help stuff ends up running out. The motivation of simply helping yourself is not enough, especially as believers. We're not called to serve self, but we are called to serve others. Self-help requires us having to constantly pump up the tyres of self-motivation again and again and again because the air goes out of them pretty quickly. Don't focus on just helping self. Look at how this perceived change, look at how this victory is going to benefit the people around you. Finishing up Genesis 22, I just want to show you something that God then gave to Abram later on, after Abram began this journey. This is some, some commentators will say between 40 to 70 years later after he started the journey. Genesis 22, verse 17 to 18. God comes back to him and reminds him again. Reminds him again. He says, I'll surely bless you and I'll make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all the nations on earth will be blessed because you obeyed me. Because I spoke to you 40 years ago and because you said yes. And I know that change was hard and I know it was difficult but you went on this journey with me because you obeyed me. All these blessings are happening in your life and the lives of those around you because you obeyed me. What's in there is what God spoke to you. I want to remind you of that. This is what God said. Obey God. There's blessing in it for you and there's blessing in it for those around you. See, I believe that every time it got a little bit tough, maybe God took Abram there and said, look at the stars. Look at the sand. And maybe when that change process got too tough for him, maybe if it was night time and he's thinking, no, I'm just going back, I can't do this, he'd walk out and look at the stars. And he had a visual. Okay, thank you, God. Maybe during the day he'd curl his toes up in the sand and look down and go, oh, look, this is tough. This sucks. This is, this is a harder journey than I thought it was going to be. I mean, the first day when the pastor said it, I got all excited and pumped and put it in the box there and yeah, I'm going to change, Lord. Whoa! <laughs> I didn't realise I'd have to do something. I just thought thine anointing would come upon me and transform me. It didn't quite work like that. I had to make some choices, decisions. I had to do some things. I had to wrestle a little bit. Roll around in the mud, do all this sort of stuff. And I think God gave him these two visual things and said, I want you to have a picture. Here's a picture. Get a picture. Because when it's tough and you want to go back, that picture will give you something to hang on to going forward. You know, sometimes I think I fight battles in my own life that previous generations couldn't be bothered fighting. Sometimes I look at the issues and things I've had to wrestle with and I think, you know, I don't think that was mine to wrestle with. I think my parents or my grandparents, or I think somebody else should have wrestled with that and beat it and they didn't. Maybe it was too hard. Maybe they, maybe they were only thinking about themselves. Pleasure of sin for a season. I don't know what it is, but they didn't wrestle it down and it just gets passed on and passed on and passed on. And sometimes I genuinely do believe that I wrestle things, that I go, God, I, it feels unfair because I feel like I shouldn't have to fight this one, but I'm not going to sit there and complain about it. I've got to win it because there's going to be a benefit and a blessing to the next generation and to those further down. I heard this guy, Phil Baker, who's a pastor in WA, and I'll finish with this. He gave us this picture one day. I was at a men's conference, and he was talking about the dumb things that men do that cost them everything. And he stood up and he said, I've got this picture. He said, I, I picture myself at the head of the table. He said, we're on a grassy lawn. There's, there's food all along the table. And on the, around the table are chairs up the side and so on. And I'm sitting at the head of the table and my wife's there at the other end. And my kids are sitting there at the table and their kids are there. My grandkids and my great-grandkids are running around and we're smiling and laughing and telling stories and having a great time with each other. He says, I have that picture in front of me. And then I tell myself, one stupid choice, you could lose it all. One dumb decision, 
He said, I lose that picture. I lose that picture. I wonder whether Abraham looked up at the stars and went, that's my picture. One dumb choice. I can back away from this. I can give in to it. I can walk away. I can go back to what's familiar and easy and comfortable and I lose it. I lose it. Russian writer Tolstoy said, everybody thinks of changing humanity and nobody thinks of changing himself. This is perhaps more pertinent amongst communities of faith where changing humanity feels like not just an ideal but a real call. Change the world, change the world. Well, if we want to change the world where we don't have much authority, start here where you have all authority. Make the changes you've got to. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to just close your eyes just for a minute. Just close your eyes for a minute. I want you to think about that thing you've got in that box. What's your picture? What's your picture? What will your world look like if you wrestle this thing down to the ground? By the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. What's your family look like? What do you look like? What do your finances look like? What do your kids look like? What do your friendships look like? What do you look like when you're all alone and nobody's around and you don't have those feelings of guilt and condemnation floating around on the inside of you? What do you feel like when you wrestle that thing to the ground? Get a picture. Get a picture. Now, if you don't wrestle that thing to the ground, you could lose it. That's your stars. That's your sand right there, that picture. So I want you to remember that picture. If you've got to go home and write it down. This is the vision of my future when I wrestle that thing to the ground by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, I want to thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for each person in this room. Lord, I want to thank you again. Father, we pray for every uh, thing in that box right now. We join our faith. We pray for each person represented and each issue, each concern, each dysfunction, each habit. Lord, each uh, uh, practice, each whatever it is that's in that box that's individual to each person. We pray for each uh, thing in there and each person represented. God, we continue to pray, God, for breakthrough, for healing, God, for restoration. God, we continue to pray that you would get in amongst that part of their world. And we pray, Father, that you would, uh, God, by your grace and your power, break that thing in people's lives, Father. And God, I pray, uh, God, as we get up and leave this place today, I pray that it wouldn't just be ho-hum another Sunday. God, I pray that we would think about that picture. And Father, when we, uh, God, get to that point where we feel like, you know, we're a week in now, the motivation's waning, it's getting tough, it's getting real, I don't like it, it's not as easy as I thought. God, when we have those thoughts, I pray, would you bring that picture back to our mind? And would you encourage us, God? Would you encourage us, Father? It's worth the effort. No matter what we have to go through to get to that picture, it's worth the effort. And thank you, Lord, that we can get there by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, thank you for each person in this room. Lord, I pray you just bless us as we go into this next week. And, Father, allow us to be a blessing to those in the world around us, God, particularly those also that don't know you, Father. Give us the opportunity to share your goodness with somebody this week who doesn't know who you are and how much you love them, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Amen.